Ahoy mates, my name is Captain Fordell, and today we're having a very special event. We're actually, we have a one-on-one -on -one interview with Chibs, the creator of Neon Blight. Neon Blight is a very cool top-down uh, cyberpunk type shooter game that I found on itch.io. And it is a game that's really beautiful and has lots of potential. And I actually got a one-on-one -on -one interview with the developer. And we're going to ask some questions, kind of hang out, and get to know this person. So uh, Chibs, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, it is me. <laughs> I'm Chibs, the solo dev right now for Neon Blight. Um, but I'm working closely with uh, Felt Positive, which I'm going to give the links to Captain. for. He's the one that's making the music for my game right now. Yeah, I, I, I saw that. When I first came into the Discord server, I saw that Felt Positive was the composer. So Yeah, he's he's great. He's He did the title music, didn't he? Yeah, he did. He did that. I'm just going to let you know how good he is. He did that uh, track in maybe an hour. Wow. Which I was stunned when he showed me. I, I, I gave him a gif of um, the town, of like the rain and lighting, and he just gave me that track and I used it because I absolutely loved it. Oh, so he used, the, he used the style in the pixel art in order to derive from that the type of melody that he pictured would go well with the game. Yeah. Wow, that's, yeah, I, I, that's very impressive. I was, I was super surprised with what he was able to put up. I take my hat off to him. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. So good. So we we have planned. Uh, I have planned seven questions for me, um, split up between three categories. But you were fine with all of them. We have a couple questions from some of the Discord, Discord users. Um, if you have any questions for me afterwards or at any time, please feel free to ask me. But mm -hmm. if you don't mind, let's go ahead and get started. All right. So the first question that I had planned is: What led you to the creation of Neon Blight? What what event or what transpired that made you think, hey, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick up all the stuff and I'm going to go out and I'm going to make a game. All right. So about two, two years ago, I, I was making this game called Himes. It was, uh, I think it was, it was the first game I was making and I didn't really have a plan for it. I was just making it as I, I went. It was kind of a test project, learn how to code and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. after maybe six months of working on it i was kind of tired of it um uh, didn't know where where to go with it uh so i i i created a game jam called bleeding tapes game jam yeah and the theme was tower defense and in my mind i had a tower defense game um in mind that was set in cyberpunk world because i love cyberpunk it's one of my favorite genres of anything really made that uh sort of blew up i guess it had over i think 800 downloads in maybe two months wow so i was like all right well i might make another cyberpunk game because <laughs> people seem to like that um it wasn't the only reason i just i i, I always had a vision of making a roguelite game and i loved cyberpunk and there wasn't really any cyberpunk games out there there was some but they weren't the ones I was looking for, so I decided to make my own roguelite mixed with gun store management. Yeah, yeah. Cyberpunk setting. So yeah, I can so understand that. that. So, so you saw you saw that the community, or yeah, we'll use community. You saw the community lacked in a certain type of game, and you thought that that game would do well. So you thought you thought if, if there's not one, then I'll make one. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, a wonderful like attitude I, to have. Yeah. Uh, it's, I, I saw a lot of the, the, there's still a lot of cyberpunk games out there, but there's not that many when you think about it. Let's say in especially in like roguelites, um, I've only seen a seen a few that are cyberpunk based in that genre. Yeah, uh, Ruiner is one of them, I think. I think that's considered cyberpunk. Um, not sure if it's a roguelite, but it's, it definitely has like bullet hell elements to it. Oh yeah. And. Yeah, I just really like the games like uh, Enter the Gungeon. Mm. I got a lot of inspiration from that one. I, I talked about that in the recording I did. Um, when describing Neon Blight, I, I I took tones from Enter the Gungeon as the as the roguelike dungeon crawler aspect, and mm -hmm. Moonlighter as the as the shopkeep aspect. Have you played Moonlighter? Uh, I have not played Moonlighter surprisingly. <laughs> it's I've I've seen things about it, and I've I've definitely. Um, uh, kind of was inspired by it, but I also saw the reviews of it not being too great. 
I, I played it myself, but we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about your game. So, speaking <laughs> back on the topic of Neon Blight, how long has it been since you started production? Uh, about a year. I believe I started around April of 2018, hmm. I think. I could pull up the pretty much the exact date if I look at when I uploaded Border, actually. Well, that's not too much trouble. Oh, no, I could figure that out in two minutes. Uh, let's see here. So, December, nope. Let me check back. May. Yeah, I think I, I started around April. April, May. All right. Started Neon Blight. So keeping on the topic of how long has it been, uh, one of the questions that we had from one of the Discord, Discord users, Minirub, uh, they ask, do you have an approximate release date? That's a tough one. Uh... I, I'm planning on either releasing it, uh, at least an early access version of it, by the end of 2019 or 2020, but I can't promise anything because, you know, release dates are tough and you never know what could change. Yeah, they could, they could become uh, longer or shorter depending on how the team is working in. I don't think yeah. you have a team, do you? It's just you? Yeah, it's just me and uh, Fail Positive, basically. Yeah, so it's a, a two-man team. Mm -hmm. I, I can admire that. It takes a certain amount of dedication, and that's something I can respect. A lot of work. <laughs> I imagine so. So where do you plan to take this? Uh, I plan to take it to Steam, if that's what your question's about. Yeah, kind of. Uh, it, it's more of after after the game is finished, so to speak. Oh, okay, yeah. Where do you where do you plan to go from there? Do you plan on putting on Steam, making it readily available? Uh, are you do you have hopes for multiplayer or stuff like that? Multiplayer, I currently I couldn't really make online multiplayer because it would I would need to rewrite the whole code. I can see so that. Yeah, it's extremely difficult to do that. But I've been fiddling around with the um, local co op recently and I, that might be a thing but all right i don't know but after the release i'm definitely not gonna put the game on the shelf i'm gonna put more content to it uh updates after updates um more quests maybe uh dlcs maybe i don't know yeah. i have i have a few ideas in my head well that's that's great and you've already answered this one but if you want to reiterate on it it's uh is this your first game it is not um, I, I've worked on, I think, two, actually, I, three or four other games before. Hmm. They were Game Jam games, so they weren't big, except for the first one, Himes, which was a six months project, and I pretty much abandoned it, because <laughs> I didn't know what to do with it. But, um, yeah, about right. five games. And now, four. oh, my apologies, continue? No, it's okay. No, I was just going to say like four or five games. Is this your last game? That's what I want to know. Because I, I've seen Neon Blight, and I've seen the art style behind it, and the general feel that it gets. You know, when you enter a game, you can you can see a lot from the creator and how much they put into it. So I, I get a general feel of, of Neon Blight, and I love I love the atmosphere that it creates. So is this your last game? And I hope, I hope that answer is a no. It's definitely a no. <laughs> I'm, I'm for sure not. It, this is for sure not my last game. Um, I love making games. It's one of my i i've I've been playing games since I've been five, and I've always dreamed to make one, and i've I've been doing that for the past year. So for me to abandon that afterwards is crazy to think about. Of course. Um, but my next games, I would love to make them in three d. Oh, that'd be wonderful. would you would you plan a three d rendering of Neon Blight? Ooh, maybe not a, be tough. maybe not a full game of Neon Blight, but maybe like one mission. Uh, or so something, so something, so to speak, like that, like uh, a full maybe for like time. a prototype, like testing out what I could do with three D. Maybe yeah, that that would be great. I would I would very much enjoy that. Yeah, that may be a thing I might do. That's further down the line. Hmm. Okay, so now where have you drawn inspiration from? A lot of places. Uh, obviously, stuff like Blade Runner. That was a huge inspiration. Hmm. Um. Cyberpunk 2077. That was another big one. Oh, yeah. I know that. It was, <laughs> looks really nice. Yeah. Uh, and I just go on art stations sometimes, and I, I look at other people's art. And 
yeah. get inspiration from other people. Obviously, I don't copy because that's that's bad. Yeah, that, that's that's bad. I, I I claim to be a pirate, and I I, I know that piracy is wrong. <laughs> yeah. Um. But yeah, my my I think my main inspiration was Blade Runner, uh, as for like the cyberpunk theme. Uh, as for the game feeling, it, it, it's more like Enter the Gungeon and Stardew Valley. Hmm. Okay, I can I can see that. Oh yeah, yeah, I can totally see it now. Uh, Basically, you, instead of having crops, you sell guns. <laughs> hey, it works. Now, um, I want to avoid the last question that I had, and I want to touch back up on one of the users again. Mini Rub's back, and um. Maybe your favorite cyberpunk novel, film, or game, etc. Uh, I believe you already answered this one. Uh, would that be Blade Runner or Blade Runner two thousand forty nine? Is one of my favorite cyberpunk movies. All right. The the original one was also pretty good, but it has a, the second one has a soft like spot for me because it was made by a uh, Canadian, French Canadian, which I am French Canadian, so ah, so you gotta support my my guys. <laughs> I can I can see that. Yeah, um, Blade Runner is one of my favorite movies. Um, games, I liked the first few, do, uh, Deus Ex, but I, I still don't know how to say it. Um, I love those games. I, I know the game you're talking about, but I, I, mm-hmm. I also have no clue how to pronounce it. <laughs> Killzone also was pretty good when I was younger. Hmm. Played that on my, on my, um, PS3. That was nice. Yeah. I don't really read books, so I couldn't tell you <laughs> for the I... novels. And um, Mini Rove, again, what are the steps when making a game? More specifically, what were the steps in making your game? Okay. So most people, most people usually do gray box testing. They have like blocks and test out the movements, stuff like that. But I started actually with the art. I started making the the town first. All right. Might have been a bad idea, but it worked out. Um, I, I, basically for my game, I, at first I was more focused on the art style of it because I wanted it to look pretty. And then came in the gameplay. Maybe after two months of making art, I started making the gameplay. Okay, so perfected that. So went back to art. The the art style, touching back on that, I, I really got the impression that it was it was it was amazing. The attention to detail. Um going back on playing Neon Blight, I noticed when going through the town, a lot of the stuff is interactable, but it has it has a certain amount of character to it. The vines mm-hmm. that are growing on some of the buildings, they've been there for a very long time. The wear and tear that was on the billboard, um the cybernetics shop is what I I, I came to call it. Pardon me. Yeah. Um, well, I have a my game kind of has a different take on cyberpunk. Uh, I I, I try to make it my own because I wanted to stand out a little bit. Oh yeah, basically it definitely the, does the that. whole yeah uh, the whole lore behind all the greenery being overgrown and stuff is you know how now pollution is everywhere from like carpet or like not carbon get like cars. And yes, I don't know factory I, stuff like that. I'm aware of uh, the situation. Yeah, uh, my main focus was to flip that and make nature the pollution. Okay, so what you're saying is in this in this world, the the amount of vegetation is lethal. So that that would explain why the the dungeon in the game is a forest. Mm-hmm. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, it, it it came across my mind. I don't think I talked about it in the recording that I did, but it came across my mind. It was a very interesting idea to make the forest the dungeon area, um, because you saw you saw a lot of these enemies with with guns, and they they appear to be wearing suits and and sunglasses. So I figured, wouldn't it make more sense to have them inside of a bunker or in some sort of building? But I, I didn't want to question that. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm planning on maybe adding different types of environments like bunkers or underground or maybe a whole tower you have to go up. Um, I, I was thinking about that. Would it be kind of like an endless mode where you couldn't you couldn't leave the tower until you got to like a certain floor? Like every every ten or fifteen floors, you, you then you get an option to leave, but 
the higher you go, the higher the reward, but the higher the risk. The tower would not be infinite. It would have an end. Okay. Uh, there would be like a bosses on each level, let's say, and the last level, don't know how high, but uh, it would be the final boss. And then that, that I think that would be more DLC content. Yeah, I, I, I buy that. And the last question that I had was, how do you feel about the indie game community today? This is this is more something that I'm interested in um, as as a as a creator and as a game player myself. I've noticed that in recent years, the ability to make games has become widespread. With uh, with softwares, it's become easy mm-hmm. for people to make make games, and it's not a terrible thing. In fact, it's it's a great thing seeing such a surge of of life and uh, all these communities popping up, like this community here. It's a very small community right now, but uh, give it time, and it'll it'll probably blow up to be one of the biggest communities that we maybe we've ever seen. <laughs> maybe not ever seen, but I well, I hope it yes. goes up. It, it's bit. an over exaggeration, <laughs> I'll admit, but it, you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, I know. But um, with all this stuff, how do you feel about the indie game community today? And what are you what are you hopeful for? Are you hopeful with it? Are you fearful with what with what might happen? Oh, it's grown so much. Um, I. I'll tell you how I first started making video games. Basically, I was looking for a game engine, and I saw these game engines being more 3D-focused, like Unity and Unreal. And then I saw Game Maker, but I also saw the price point, which was, I think at the time, to $100 or $100. Yeesh. And back then, I was I was in high school, and I, I didn't work. So it was a bit expensive. Yes. But... Uh, on the same day, I saw um, Game Maker on Humble Bundle for a dollar. I jumped on it and started making my game from there. God bless Humble Bundle. <laughs> it, I I I think if that I think if Game Maker was in a dollar on Humble Bundle that day, I might not even be making games today. <laughs> I can agree. That's just like how lucky I was. Yeah, uh, but. Then, when I, st- I started making games, I had a lot of trouble uh, actually learning them. I looked at tutorials, but I'm, I'm kind of the type of guy that needs a one-on-one on explaining things. Yeah. And I found this great community on Discord. They have a, also a Reddit. It's called r slash Game Maker. Right. It's fully about Game Maker. Um, over there, they're super helpful. They're super nice. That's, that's uh, perfect. It's, I think the community is over a thousand or two thousand people on there now. Yeah. It it blew up. Uh, when I first joined, I think it was maybe six, half a year open, and since then, I think there was over a thousand people that joined, hmm. and it's it's just been growing. People have been helping each other, uh, making games, helping with code, art. Um, the the more we go forward, the more the indie game community is growing, I believe. And that's that's a great thing. It, it truly is, especially with with big companies. Now, there's nothing wrong with big companies, but big companies like Sony, Microsoft, Nintendo, uh, mm-hmm. they they have established brands. You know, everyone knows Mario. Uh, everyone yeah. knows Halo. They know Call of Duty. They know those names. They know those brands. So mm-hmm. with an indie community, uh, with an indie community or an indie creator. It's difficult if they have such a great game to get out there. It they may get out there, yeah, it is. But it would take some time, and it would take lots of feedback from tons of different people all over the platform. Mm -hmm. So with the indie game community seeing this surge of creators and this surge of original content, it's a great thing. But it's also going to flood it, and that's not that's not a bad thing because that means people like like us game game players we have nothing to stop us from playing games in fact mm-hmm. uh me now as opposed to growing up i have no limit to games i can play if i can't afford something because i'm a college student if i can't afford a game on steam i can go on itch.io or i can go on game Jolt and i can find a game on there to play and that's a great thing but yeah. whenever i was younger i was restricted to buying games from walmart or gamestop or some other similar store or other community place that would sell mm-hmm. your games. For sure, the the the, the amount of ex- the internet now is just full of creative people with creative ideas, yeah. especially in, in the gaming scene. There's so many small games 
that I've discovered that are so good, and I I would not have discovered them like if it wasn't for the internet. Yeah, and especially itch itch.io is one of the greatest sites I believe for uh, indie indie devs. I, it's there's also Game Jolt, but I I just I don't know Game Jolt. I, I like itch better. Game Jolt for me, it was kind of a it was kind of a passing fancy for me. I came on and it was kind of difficult to find games, but the itch.io mm-hmm. the way that they present their games, new and popular. Uh, they put the most popular genres up there: horror, adventure, point and click. They they have all those up there readily available on the straight homepage. Then you yeah. can manage your downloads. It asks you if you'd like to donate some money to the developers. It's yeah. it's a really great site when it comes to developers gaining revenue, gaining publicity, and it's a really great site for when people like us, game players, come on to look for something new. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, it, it, plus, itch.io has um, a form that I discovered recently. I didn't mm-hmm. know about it. And there's tons of people just talking about how to do this and how to do that, helping each other. And seeing that just brings me joy because it's a big community being together, helping each other out, supporting each other. Precisely. Just, yeah, it makes me happy. So how would you how would you describe, in, in, in maybe one or two words, how would you describe how you feel about the indie game community today? Are you, are you hopeful for it? Are you... Very are you hopeful. Hopeful, good. It, it's... I, we had well last year, year before I can't remember. There was a big, I guess, indie apocalypse. You would call it the indie apocalypse. Indie apocalypse, yeah, that's the word I was looking for. And now, this year, at the beginning of the year, it's we're we're back on track. It's not as bad. We have sites like Epic Games coming in clutch with the <laughs> this really small revenue share. Uh, Discord now has a store, which is also pretty good too. Yeah. Uh, sites like Itch make it way more accessible for for indies to come out and shine, I guess. But yeah, I I, I really I'm very hopeful to the future for the indie game. Yeah, uh, indie dev community. Now there there are some things that I talked about in my video that I want to avoid talking about, but it was it was generally about the the buildings that you had. So I might I might mm-hmm. wait until later. But if you'd like, um, if if you if you want, we're running about twenty two minutes, which is kind of short for a podcast. But we could totally end it off here, if you'd like. I could bring up the topics that I was thinking or I was talking about in the video. Yeah, no problem. I'd love to. So in in the video, I took a lot of time to walk around the map and kind of look around the map and interact with things. And I noticed that you can interact with one of the buildings. And the main character, is it Laura? Yeah, thank, Lara. Thank you. Uh, like I said, I have, I have a bad tendency of butchering names, and it makes me feel terrible. But <laughs> it's when, okay. when interacting with the building, um, the character says, what, what a quaint, or I'm paraphrasing here, but what a quaint building. Uh, maybe I can relocate my gun shop here. But I need to find the key. So that's that's hinting at maybe a future release, or is this key available in the current build? It is not currently available. Um, but in the future, you'll have access to that building. Do you want to do you want to tease uh, anything for it, or? Well, let's just. I'm gonna say that it's gonna be a different area for your gun shop. All right. You will have more options, I guess. So. Uh, Another thing that I noticed in the in the map was the Noodle Man. Of course, everyone talks about the Noodle Man. Everyone likes, <laughs> loves the Noodle Man. You either love or you hate the Noodle Man. There's no in between. But I noticed the Noodle Man. I noticed the drugs counter, and I also noticed the medical shop. Now, when mm-hmm. I was in the, whenever I was in the the, the recording talking about the map, uh, I was talking about how I would love to see these shops or these buildings become interactable. Uh, as the noodle man could sell you items like bags of noodles or packs of noodles that you can take with you into the the dungeons, and he can have something for a quick buff or maybe life regain or the drugs, the drugs kind of area, the shop that sells drugs or has drugs on it. Mm-hmm. That could be something for for health, and then the medic could either 
extend your life by one or or refill your life for a price or something like that. And I just wanted to know if you had any ideas or anything like that for those three shops in, in particular. Well, they're all going to be in Tarak. Um, the Medic is currently fully functional now. Uh, well, fully. I mean, it, it, it has the basics. You can heal up and you can ta talk to the doctor. It's not in the current build, but uh, I'll be releasing one pretty soon. All right. Uh, I'll keep my eyes out. Yeah. Uh, the drugstore, that's going to be more of um, kind of an ability shop. Uh, let's say you take a drug and you'll be faster for, I don't know, a minute. All right. I'm just throwing that out there. So, so um, buffs and debuffs. Yeah, exactly. You might, even if you take too many drugs, you might have side effects, you know? Yeah. Who knows? Um, what was the other one you, you, you said you wanted to know about? The Noodle Man. The noodle, yeah, the, man, noodle man. the noodle Man is the one that I'm really concerned about because <laughs> the Noodle Man is such a quirky character. Even from the short little dialogue interaction that I got from uh, the Noodle Man, I really enjoyed it and I want to see more of the Noodle Man. So he's going to have stuff for you to buy, like noodles, ice cream, stuff like that. It's going to be for your health. No, no, and, no. Uh, will, will we have the opportunity to have ice cream noodles? Maybe. Maybe? Who okay. knows? <laughs> I'll, I'll keep he my might, hopes He up. might be throwing out... Uh, uh, a combo with it, I don't know. But uh, the Noodle Man will have a quest line. He'll have a story. Uh, you'll you'll be able to meet him and know his background, why he's there. Uh, yeah, I have plans with him. All right. He's he's uh, he's a little character I, I I like, and I want to make a whole thing about him. Okay. Now, one of the other buildings that I had a, a lot of interest in was the. Uh... The cybernetic shop. That, that, that's what I call it. That's what I call it in the video, and that's what, I, that's what I've, I've come to call it. But it's the shop that's right next to Inc. Incorporated, which is the tattoo parlor, that has biotech. the billboard on it. Yeah, biotech. Thank you. Yeah. Is that going to be a cybernetic shop? I was talking about in the video how it would be really cool if you got further on in the game, how you could get uh, bionics equipped into your character. Like, if you had, if you had like, an attachment on your eye, it would... It would improve your accuracy with certain weapons. Or if you had an attachment to your arm, it'd decrease your reload time. Do you have any plans for that, or what do you have planned for the biotech? Biotech is exactly going to be that. It's going to be um, body upgrades. Uh, you'll, you'll be able to get perks from modifying your body over there. It might not be visual because, you know, it's tiny pixel art. But it will you will be able to modify your your body and uh, use different abilities. Yeah. Maybe have I don't know uh, bionic legs, which makes you walk faster, or bionic arms, which improves your aim. I don't know. Yeah. There's definitely going to be a lot of customization with that. Well, that's what I like to see. I like to see custo uh, character customization in games like that. Uh, I was talking about it in the video, but. The way I play games is odd in the sense that I don't, I don't straight go for trying to boost how much damage I do or how much life I have. I, instead, I want to I want to try and boost my speed because I'm under mm -hmm. the assumption that if I can be faster than when I'm fighting and I can dodge most of the attacks, then I can save my money for more important stuff down the road. Yeah, I'm I'm the same type of guy. I I like moving fast rather than being super slow and super buff. Ah, yes. I'm the rogue type of player. Now, the the tattoo shop. Since you were saying that you wanted you you had plans for the drugstore to be buffs and debuffs and the cybernetic shop is what we were talking about uh and the medic. What I talked about in the video was the tattoo parlor being something that the character can go and get tattoos from. And after so many successful kills, maybe the tattoos are embedded with some sort of nano machine since it's future futuristic. And you have a meter up in the upper right that if you got so many kills within so so much time, you'd fill up this little meter and you you'd get something like bullet time or increased speed or uh, damage resistance for a short period of time. What are your plans for that? Or are the is the tattoo parlor parlor only going to be cosmetic? It's sort of going to be just cosmetic, but it will also have a intimidation factor to it. Okay. So let's say you have a bunch of, I don't know, skulls on your body. Um, maybe some enemies will be scared of you and will run away instead of 
start attacking you. Okay, yeah. Uh, or maybe in some missions, some quests you do about, let's say, talking to someone and try to interrogate them for something. Uh, if you have tattoos, it might help you intimidate them or something. Okay, yeah, I can see that. Now, uh, uh, as opposed to the intimidation factor, what if you had a certain tattoo? Like, you said, you gave the example skulls that would intimidate some people. What if you had something like uh, a unicorn? Just as a hypothetical, what if you had a unicorn <laughs> and that made you more prone to be attacked? Yeah, maybe, yeah. Okay. I mean, I haven't really thought about uh, the whole uh, tattoo aspect, but I, I've, I've thought about it in the sense that it will have an intimidation factor to it. And if you have, let, let, like, let's say, a ridiculous tattoo, people might not take you seriously. Yeah. Well, the, the only reason why I say that is we were talking, you were talking about a, a co-op, like a local co-op. Mm -hmm. what, if, what if you had two people that were in and one person had the intimidating tattoo and the other person had the, the unicorn tattoo? We'll, we'll, we'll use the unicorn as the hypothetical, but that person that has the unicorn is this really big, tanky character. They, they don't, may not necessarily look tanky, but they're they're meant to aggro enemies onto them so they can take damage so the other person can can deal with them and, and aspects like that mm -hmm. maybe yeah yeah I, I i don't know how far the co-op mode will take it i don't know if it's just going to be in the forest area or it's just going to be the whole game being able to play in co-op yeah uh it's definitely a, it's going to be a huge challenge to add co-op because it was programmed for single player uh but yeah I'll I'll see what I can do with that. Okay. Now another question from Minirub, uh, talking back on the intimidation and all that. Are you thinking on implementing some kind of role play mechanic? Yes and no. Uh, there will be role playing factors to it and mechanics, but it won't be like The Witcher. It won't be like Skyrim. It's going to be very light uh, role playing. Um, going back to one of my inspiration, Stardew Valley. It kind of has RPG factors to that game, but it's not extreme. You don't have, let's say, split in dialogues everywhere, and, uh, choices that make your life harder, or I don't know. Um, but there is going to be quests, and you will have to make decisions and stuff like that, yeah. All right. Um... The light role playing. The, the last two questions that I have about the buildings would be the Eden Blue and the the other one next to it. I can't remember the name of it. Neon Stop? Yes, the Neon Stop. Whenever I was talking about it in the recording, um, the Neon Stop sounded like a cafe or a diner. And I was talking about how it would be a very nice add-on where the Neon Stop could be a diner or a cafe where you can go in and collect information from other NPCs. Or there might be a billboard where... You can go up to the billboard and you can get like bounties or quests and you can walk up and it would say wanted uh, so much so of certain enemy reward, either a gun or a certain amount of money. Would you, mm -hmm. would you be interested in putting something like that in or did you have plans for that shop? Well, my plans for that shop was to turn it into a diner, <laughs> like a, a little New York diner style thing. Yeah, yeah, the, the mom and pop burger shop as an example. Yeah, exactly. I, I want to turn it into that, but the the idea of uh, bounty hunts that's that's pretty neat. I might do that. Well, that and, would uh, that would be pretty great. Yeah, and for Eden Eden uh, Eden Blue, that's the nightclub city. Okay. Uh, it's you, you're gonna have like music, uh, dance floor stuff like that. You, I don't know if you'll be able to interact with those, but hopefully you will be. Well, that that's uh, totally wrong from what I assumed. I assumed it was it was some sort of shop that you would you would use to kind of upgrade or renovate your own gun shop. Actually, it still could be. Uh, would you would you what would you think about a character in the Eden Blue nightclub that was uh, a character that would help you renovate your shop, adding more floor space or giving certain upgrades to your shop by being in the nightclub, like a uh, kind of like a big mob mafia boss. There might be some mob or whatever in the game, in the nightclub, a but I won't say further. <laughs> a cyberpunk there's, Tom Nook. Is there, there's, def <laughs> there's definitely gonna be some uh, secret, not society, but some secret group where you could fiddle with them. 
right. Deep uh, stuff. Well, I, I have to tell you, I'm, I'm super excited for this game. Um, Thank you. That's all the questions that I have. If you have any questions for me, that now would be the time to ask them. Well, I the main question I, I wanted to know is, uh, what do you feel about the um, game? What, what do I feel about the is... game? No, I mean the um, the community of the indie game. Oh, community. what do I feel about the indie game community right now? Well, as I said before, I'm I'm hopeful, but again, I'm fearful for the indie game community. Um, in my experience, anytime you flood a community or anytime you flood a a group or any any type of situation like that, you get the surplus surplus of amazing creators and they they work really well together but um in the saying one bad apple spoils the bunch in my experience it's been true uh you have one person that's completely negative and they come in and they just tear it down from the inside so i'm hopeful to see a lot of indie game developers and indie games coming out but i i'm really hoping that we don't get trolls and people who come in and just disrespect the community for what it is because over the years a lot of assumptions have been made about gaming and a lot of those assumptions have been proven wrong uh, a big one whenever i was uh, a child was video gaming makes you dumber and mm -hmm. that's a completely ludicrous statement because of the way i carry myself the way i exer uh, execute vo my vocabulary and the way i the way i carry conversation that's that's a completely ludicrous statement now, mm -hmm. I, I, and the other argument that video games make you violent precisely that's another crazy one <laughs> precisely uh i'm not a very violent person i'm I'm passionate i'll say that i know i know a lot of a lot of gamers me myself included in games that are competitive let's let's use overwatch as an example in mm -hmm. games like overwatch where it's very competitive uh, it's easy to get heated and very upset it's not because we're upset at the game or other players it's it's that we're frustrated with ourselves because we want to get better. Mm -hmm. And I can understand that. I can understand that other people are mad or they're frustrated because they want to get better. But um, just last night, me and my friends were playing uh, some competitive matches. And on the NE team, there were two throwers. And Overwatch is not a free game. It is $60, which means that these two people paid $60 each to jump into a match to sit in competitive, to feed, to throw, to just sit there and not contribute. And it's it's something that makes me fearful for the community. And if we get a large community together and it, everyone works so well together, I'm afraid to see how big it will fall. Or how, mm -hmm. how big the fall will be if it ever does fall. Yeah, I understand that. Um, there's, a, there's a lot, I, I think... The main problem with these kind of things, I, me, I've noticed that the more, let's say, let's talk about the people that play Overwatch on Twitch. Yeah. Uh, you'll have Tim Tapman that used to play Overwatch. He had XQC. Those were like two people. They weren't, let's say, toxic, but they, they had big mouths. You know, they they talked a lot. They they and they were pretty big. They put a lot of attention on Overwatch. Yeah. And made it a tiny bit more toxic. Toxic. I'm not saying it's their fault. I'm just saying streamers and YouTubers contribute to making community more more prone yeah. to something. Yeah. Um I, I see what you're saying. Um the influence of a role model. Yeah, influence. Yeah. Um I I have going back on the Tim, let's say his stream is very vulgar he he has like a, a big personality he he's loud and his chat is also loud he they, they're all not vulgar but they're trolly they they they're like that and let's say if you take it back to one of the, the streamers i watch ob ob 190 uh shout out to her she's very calm she's very she's not her her community reflects the community reflects who the person is, I think. Okay, yeah, I can understand that. That's that's one of the reasons why I I started getting interested in doing YouTube. Actually, is because uh, I was influenced by this community that I saw, and I was inspired to do something like that because I figured 
to me myself, I enjoy making people happy. I enjoy making jokes, and I enjoy I enjoy making things and playing video mm-hmm. games. So me myself, I became a YouTuber because I like doing those things. But after seeing the current state of YouTube with certain YouTubers, I became disgruntled. And when in, when in a conversation, and I say actually as a hobby, not not so much as a job as I'd hope it was, but as a hobby right now, I'm a YouTuber. And people mm-hmm. look at me with uh, with a little of a with a cockeyed stare, or they give me stink eye because when I say that, their automatic thought is these bad images. And yeah. what I want to kind of do is I want to come out and I want to be an influence of positivity and good, shining light on indie games and indie developers because they need that praise. And I want to kind of be, I want to be that person that people can look at in a positive light as a, mm-hmm. as a YouTuber, I want to be a positive light. I want to influence the community into being more positive and saying, Hey, this is great. I'm excited for this. Let's, let's do this. And that's, that's what I'd like to be. So I can, I can totally agree with that. The, the type of person that gives the game attention will influence and affect the gameplay and the people that play the game. I can totally agree with that. Yeah. Um, since you said that, I had um the main reason why my my game blew up mostly was because PC Gamer made an article on it. Um, <laughs> it's funny how I I I saw that article. I was playing Rocket League. And I was in a competitive match. I looked at my phone and I saw PC Gamer wrote an article on my game. I dropped everything and I looked at it. And um, let me just say that the whoever the person is, I don't blame them. I there there wasn't any there wasn't a lot of information about my game except for on my Twitter. They they kind of over not overscoped, but they they described my my games a little bit wrongly. They they did a, did they didn't really read up on my Twitter. They didn't really follow me. Uh, basically, my game was meant to be a playtest build. Yeah, and it it blew up. I didn't know I was gonna do that, and I was I was just releasing it for my followers at first. I wanted to put it in a Dropbox uh, and send it to people, but I was like, eh, I'm gonna put it on Itch, let people download it and have fun with it, play and, test it. And then it completely blew up. Then what was your initial reaction on that? Uh, I was at first I was super happy. Still am. There's a lot of action on the on the game now. Um, I'm super happy about that. Uh, but some articles, especially the PC Gamer one, has comments that aren't very nice. <laughs> but I expect that from people. Yeah, that's that's kind of what you can expect it's... from the internet right now. Um, yeah. If you have – for every good comment you get, you get a terrible comment. In fact, um, during one of my the first pe- live streams, uh, I got a negative comment. And I remember talking about it to my friends and even my, my acquaintances outside – of my YouTube and outside of my friend group and they were asking me how my live stream went and I, I turned to them with a smile on my face and I said, it went great. I got my first hate comment. And they go, yeah. why is that Why is that something to be happy about? Because it's, plebis- it's still publicity. They took the time yeah. out, of the, out of their day to leave that hate comment. So the joke's on them. I, I, I didn't really get uh, I didn't really get discouraged by the, I didn't get discouraged at all actually from the Hate comments because you can't get discouraged by hate comments. Oh, I'll tell you that now. There's bound to be some. Exactly. And most of the time, they're the ones who talk the most. The ones I I would say there were over I don't know 800 people that flooded in through that article, and what 13 of them put a comment on the page and said that well not 13 but like five of them said something bad about my game or I I don't know it's. It's a very small percentage. Yeah, but yeah, that's what I was about to say. Looking at it statistically, <clears throat> eight hundred people came in. Uh, let, let's let's use the assumption thirteen people commented, and only five of those comments were negative. That mm-hmm. means that there was this larger, very large portion that didn't comment. Thirteen that did, five that left ne- negative. That's that's positive. That that's a win mm-hmm. in my book. Yeah, definitely. Um, and e- even if I there, there's hate comments, I. Me personally, I have this thing where if you have hate, you found a little bit of success. Of course. 
because most of the time when you're smaller people will encourage you and say you got this you're you're doing it but the bigger and bigger you get the people the, will start being oh i'm jealous i'm gonna go bash on this person or whatever precisely so yeah i i see that as a minor success that that that's actually a great success i i would i would mark that a uh, victory in my book but of course if like let's say 60 percent are hate comments I'm, then i'm gonna question but <laughs> yeah yeah if it's a I, small percentage i'm fine with i i yeah i can agree on that one Small percent, yeah, you know, I could brush that off. Any, any bigger than that, I might have to reevaluate some things. But yeah, <laughs> well, that was that was actually very nice. Thank you very much for joining me. Uh, that's all the questions I have. If you guys have any more questions in the chat, if you have any questions for me, Chibs, I'm completely fine with it. But other than that, uh, let's get uh, ready to take this down. Uh, we're running about 45 minutes, so that's perfect. This will yeah. not be edited. This will be a straight run through. So anyone, that's perfect. Anyone in the chat that missed it, they'll be they'll be able to. Uh, oh, to we got a question. It. I don't I don't mean to interrupt you, but we got a question. Oh no, you're about, fine. Are you gonna put uh, more memes in the game aside from the meme? Actually, no. Thank <laughs> you, Mini Rub. That's actually one of the questions that I had planned to ask, but I slipped my mind. In the dungeon, you have or the the. The character has a tendency to yell yeet when firing the weapon. Is that the only line that they're going to say, or can we expect more lines? Because my me more personally, lines. myself, I enjoy that. I talk about it in the video, but I believe it gives that character some depth. It makes it more relatable. Yeah, uh, well, there's going to be a lot more lines than that. I'm going to put a lot of quirky lines. All right. Um, yeet was, for now, was just a placeholder. And I haven't released any other builds, so it's the only line that's available. She's um, gonna be a fine master. <laughs> oh, actually, this is this is actually a very big topic. Now that I think about it, is this game going to be explicit uh, in the sense of are you going to have curse words in it? I will have some, uh, but it, it won't be over the top. I, okay. I won't be offensive because okay. I usually don't like offensive. But you know. Cyberpunk is more of a gritty genre, and it's a more of a dark genre. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna bring that in a little bit, but I'm also gonna bring comedy in. Yeah, uh, it's gonna be a mix of both. Won't be too gritty. Well, and too offensive. The the only reason I ask is, and the only reason that came to mind was, Minnie Rub says that she's going to be a vine master. One of my favorite vines is the is the vine where the child or the, or the kid. I'm not gonna say child. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna drop the. The whole sophisticated act right here, but it's when the kid it's when the kid walks in, he he turns the phone on himself, he's like, This is how I walk into my house, and then he walks in. <laughs> you, you know yeah, what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. That's my favorite one. And for the longest time, that's how I entered a room. So I would <laughs> I would love there to be a I would love there to be a scene where the there's a dungeon that has multiple rooms and there there's a group of enemies that's sitting at a table. Uh, interacting with each other, maybe talking, just sitting there, and Laura, uh, Laura can kick the door in and yell that line, and then the, the the whole thing starts. Bullets are flying everywhere. I would love that personally, me myself, that would kill me. That that would be awesome. I'm I'm definitely gonna put some comedic factors to to something. Have reference. I don't know Vine or I don't know. Here's one. I like. By Night Owl, do you intend to make more towns? Uh, well, technically, yeah. Well, basically, the town is very small right now, and it's going to be a lot, well, it's going to be bigger. I'm not going to say how much bigger, but it's going to be bigger. It's going to have, um, I don't know if you noticed at the top of the town where it has, like, a tiny market. Yeah, I noticed. In, the, in, the, in, between, the, in the, between the apartments. It's going to have that a whole different area. It's going to be a huge hallway of marketplaces. Uh, kind of like the, that classic cyberpunk feeling of big apartment buildings or whatever and small markets. Um, yeah. But yeah, uh, the town's going to be bigger. It's going to have more stuff in it, more people. In, Currently, there's nobody. In the sense uh, of of the uh, the town being bigger, are you going to make it, are you going to divide it into uptown, downtown kind of area? I'm going to divide it in different areas. Yeah, um, like let's say the, the, the apartment market, uh, the hallway market, let's say. 
it, it's going to be a different area. All right. Um, not not because it's more of an optimization. Yeah. It's more of a ease of programming. Yeah. But yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, thank you again so much for joining me. And if there are, are no other questions, I believe we're good. We're about 50 minutes in. Mm -hmm. So that's that's wonderful. Thank you all so much for joining me. Uh, thank you, Chibs, for joining me. Uh, no problem. Any last words, fun. closing remarks? Uh, no, not really. Uh, I'm just going to plug myself, if you don't mind. No, please. Please do. All right. Well, uh, you can go follow me on Twitter, one pixel Chibs. Or you could also follow me on Patreon, Chibs, with two eyes. And if you're super lazy, like I tend to be, and you don't want to go in and search it, you can find it down in the description below. As always, if you want to try Neon Blight for yourself, or support Chibs on Patreon or Twitter, and download the game on itch.io, it'll all be down in the description below. Thank you all so much for watching. And as always, my name is Captain, Captain Cordell, and I'm shipping out.